Go. Well, I am happy to be able to add Syriac to the list of languages <laughs> being discussed here. Uh, I realized as I was working on my presentation that for some reason I chose a more sophisticated title than the actual content of my presentation. Uh, by polyvalent infrastructures, I mean infrastructures that are intended to address a variety of needs and audiences. And really, I want to step back. I do want to introduce the Syriaca.org project. Some of you are already familiar with it. But the main thing that I want to do is to take a step back and look at some high-level conceptual problems in the way that we approach digital humanities projects, and specifically digital infrastructures. I'll give some examples of how we addressed those problems. But of course, I really would like to hear your input about how we corporately can address those problems better. So first of all, the Syriaca.org project um, has a number of different sponsors, as you see there. The, the primary team is David Michelson at Vanderbilt University. He's the general editor. Daniel Schwartz at Texas A&M. He's the principal investigator. Jean-Nicole Mellon Saint Laurent, who works on hagiography, and Thomas Carlson, who works on geography, and our heroic web developer, Winona Celeste. So first, I'll give you an overview of Syriaca.org and then dive into three particular challenges. The challenge of audience, which I've categorized as archivists versus researchers the challenge of workflow, traditional versus digital, and the challenge of time frame, better access versus better paradigms. So what is Syriac? Well, that's a question I get asked a lot. <laughs> it's a dialect of Aramaic. It flourished on the Mesopotamian plateau, especially starting in the third century for about a millennium, but there are still Syriac communities and Syriac speakers today, small as they are. It was active from the Eastern Mediterranean all the way, in some cases, to Mongolia and China, but particularly in this Mesopotamian plateau and Central Asia. And it has more than 10,000 extant manuscripts. In fact, that's the lower limit because we really don't know how many Syriac manuscripts there are because we don't have the kind of uh, infrastructure to count them. Uh, but that, so far as I understand, would make it um, the third uh, the, the language with the largest representation for late antiquity after Greek and Latin. So it provides very important sources for the study of late antiquity, for the medieval Near East. It provides sources that can be taken in parallel with Arabic sources for the Near East and provide uh, really helpful perspectives there. So Syriaca.org then is a reference hub for digitally linking research findings. Now, that includes publications that compile and classify core data, uh, that offer the scholarly community digital tools for disseminating that data, and that facilitate further research through the creation of shared digital tools, and here I'll emphasize, and infrastructure. So what are our infrastructural goals? Well. Those would be to identify Syriac entities, like people, places, and works, with stable URIs and plug them into a linked open data architecture. And here I want to emphasize we're starting way behind where Greek and Latin started. So we have no TLG for Syriac, no um, clavis that was already developed in print that we can move into a digital framework. We, what we do have are 19th, 20, early 20th century works that in some, to some extent can serve as reference works but um, really are very out of date and that are not in any way comprehensive. So uh, in terms of infrastructure, we're trying to connect different projects and resources. There are a lot of different uh, digital humanities projects going on and connecting different audiences. I'll show you how we're trying to do that. So. In terms of the entities we're dealing with, we're especially dealing with places, persons, texts, including both conceptual works and manuscripts uh, and bibliography like editions and um, translations. And then we, we touch on events a little bit with a prosopographical project called Sphere. But these are the different uh, publications that are currently 
either published or in process. Uh, and uh, as you see, we have most of our, our resources are in the areas of persons and texts. Uh, in terms of the number of records we have, that might be a little small, but the, the brown are place records, the pink are person records, the red are works records. Most of them at this point are hagiography, but we have um, a number of new data sets coming into the pipeline. Uh, gray are bibliography, and yellow are manuscripts. In terms of connecting projects and resources, um, let me give you an example of how this works. I'll try to do this live. Let's see. So here we have a record for a Syriac person, Isha Dot of Merv. I think that's large enough for you to see, more or less. And you see that we have, uh, most importantly, a URI for Isha Dad right here. We've collected some names for Ishadad in uh, Syriac, English, French, Arabic. Uh, we connect him to the place Merv. That's an obvious connection, although in some cases we have uh, 10, 10 or more places connected to a particular author. We give him a basic date. And we give some source information here. And you'll notice that these function as footnotes for these names and other data. Now, if we click on Merv, this should take us to the entry for Merv in the Syriac Gazetteer. And here we can explore the map. We can look at coordinates, names, etc. We can go to, for instance, Wikipedia and see the Wikipedia entry on Merv. We can go to Pleiades. All of these records for persons and places, readable HTML5 web page, but also the TEI, which is accessible right here. Um, Matt, you need to install Syriac fonts on your computer. <laughs> Not my computer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and those, those links are machine readable relationships, which can also be serialized as RDI. So, uh, going back to Ishodad, then we can also connect to some other resources uh, relating more to library. I think these, yes, here they are. So we have 96 catalog search results from WorldCat. This is based on our identification of Ishodad with the Virtual International Authority file URI here, and we've submitted Ah, a Syriac name <laughs> to the VF repository. VF connects national libraries from all over the world. And, uh, oh, and we also have the comprehensive bibliography on Syriac Christianity, which is a huge and extremely useful bibliography for Syriac studies. So there's just some examples of how we're connecting projects and resources. Let me see if I can bring this up again. Mm. Okay. Now, in terms of connecting audiences, we're trying to collect, connect libraries with scholars. We're trying to connect heritage communities with students. Uh, I'll skip over the example that I have there, which is in the slide notes, but uh, for the sake of time, because I want to get on to the challenges that we're facing. So first of all, the challenge of audience, archivists versus researchers. Now, I don't mean to offend anyone by implying that Archivists are not researchers or vice versa. Of course, I recognize the overlap there. But I do want to address the challenges of meeting both of those needs. So imagine an archivist and a researcher walk into a bookstore. What do they see? Well, the archivist sees the books and envisions them in this gorgeous library, cataloged, 
cross-referenced, easy to find, and available to the masses forever. But the researcher imagines piling these books one on top of the other to build a nuanced, well-researched argument, something that is interconnected, something that even contains doors to other rooms full of arguments based on sources. What do I mean by this? Well, the archivists and research, uh, researchers have different objectives, and I continue to face this every time I meet with either digital humanities projects in universities or archives, librarians, and so on. So archivists are building authority files, and these need to be accessible. They need to be long-term. They need to be usage-based. Researchers, for example, are building biographical dictionaries or clavices and so on. These need to be nuanced, specific, evidence-based. What connects the two are stable URIs. So for example, just yesterday I was talking with someone from the Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin about the Syriac manuscripts in their catalog. And they're way ahead of most archives for Syriac in the sense that they have publicly accessible XML files that are licensed under a CC license. But their catalog does not contain any links to authority URIs for Syriac authors, for example, or Syriac works. So they were very eager to have us help with linking those authors and works. I'll give you an example here of Theodore Barconi. Now, <clears throat> Theodore Barconi has several different spellings to his name. You see here Kiwani, uh, you'll see Barconi spelled with C-H, all kinds of different spellings. But we went through the VF records for the Theodore Barconi, and we were able to identify about 10 of them. Now, there's supposed to be one VF URI for each person, but in this case, there were 10 due to all of these different spellings and due to the fact that they didn't have Syriac specialists working on these URI identifications or these, these identifications in library catalogs. And then once we exported that ref record to VF, VF was able to combine those URIs into a single URI so that now there's only one URI for Theodore Barconi. <coughs> Excuse me. So, in terms of archivists, what are the kinds of questions that archivists ask? Well, these are questions that I get very, very frequently. What is the authorized or standardized name for? And here I have to keep emphasizing, no, we're not concerned about name forms. We're collecting as many of them as we can, but we're concerned about what is authoritative is the URI. Or how should the name be transliterated? Well, there is no standard transliteration system for Syriac. There are many different systems, and most of them are poorly documented. How does it normally appear in secondary literature? Or which part of the name should I alphabetize by? Which is very tricky, because somebody like Theodore Barconi, we would alphabetize by Theodore, but Gregory Bar Hebraeus, we would alphabetize by Bar Hebraeus. So the ways that we're trying to apply ourselves to these challenges include the fact that we're labeling each language, each um, name element or title element with the, not only the language, but also the transliteration system that is being used. Uh, we're labeling at least one name for each language as being our head word, and we explain that this is the, our preferred name that we display in our system, but it's not the equivalent of an authorized name heading. And uh, we provide a UP, an API that you can feed a URI into and get back names in uh, a particular language or according to a particular transliteration system and so on. In some cases, we also break these names into parts so that we can sort okay, in this case, Bar Hebraeus is the name that you should sort by, or Theodore is the name that you should sort by. But what are the researchers' questions? How, how is this person mentioned in primary sources? What are the different ways scholars have referred to her or him? On what base evidence can 
she or he be identified with or distinguished from other authors. And some of these challenges we've tried to address by providing, for one, machine-readable sources. So in TEI, we do this using the source attribute. And we provide those for as many data points as we can, names, dates, and so on. And on the human-readable page, these appear as footnotes. When there's a question of identity, we can also create uh, records for ambiguous or unknown persons such as the author of such and such a work and then provide relationships of possibly identical to or not the same as to disambiguate these persons. So for example, we could say that the author of this section of the Chronicle of Zuknin is possibly identical with Joshua the Stylo. The second challenge that we face is workflow. And one of the topics that has already been mentioned here is the perceived value of digital scholarship. So I think a lot of this has to do with the perceived differences in workflow between traditional and digital scholarship. And here I'd like you to imagine a market. What kind of market? Well, first of all, we could go for a supermarket. And a traditional workflow would be like a supermarket where you have an order procedure that prioritizes quality control, it prioritizes checks. And the traditional concerns here are for traditional workflows are quality, citability, and permanence. But the digital workflow might be like the stock market. Priority is on real-time collaboration and results. You need accessibility, you need currency, you need usability. Here's how I imagine the different workflows. So traditional workflow, you have research, then you submit your article, it gets peer reviewed, gets published, um, or if it's a book, you get published reviews of the book. Now, all of us involved in digital humanities know that a traditional scholarly workflow does not guarantee quality control. And a digital project workflow can still have quality control, but we're also dealing with these perceptions of what a digital workflow is like. So a stereotyped digital workflow might look something like this. You research, then you simply upload it. Maybe it gets comments. Maybe, maybe it gets revised. You can understand why traditional scholarship would have a problem with this kind of workflow. What is the actual workflow we're trying to implement for Syriaca.org? Like this. There's research, then we have, usually have some kind of internal review. We upload a draft publication. There's a board review using the Perseid system. Gets published. There are open comments. There's more revision, republication, and finally, published reviews of this in traditional um, scholarly venues. So how do we go about uh, something like this? Well, for one, we've tried to separate, um, we've tried to combine processes from software development with processes from traditional publishing. And we've tried to make those relatively transparent. So for one, we separate the data from the application, you know, model view controller, so that the data has its own scholarly life. And that data is independent of the changes we make to the application. But we're also using GitHub repositories and change logs in the documents to track these changes, to be able to roll them back if necessary. Um, and the way that we've set these up is in our GitHub repo, uh, one branch is for the development server, and it publishes draft records. Another branch is for the, uh, the production server, and it publishes published records. And these records are, are visibly labeled on the site as being draft or in review or published. As I said, we use the, the um, Perseid system. Uh, we're getting that set up to be able to have um, subject experts review each record. And these would be people who have not contributed to or edited the record previously. And then we're also trying to work toward an open peer review system after the record has been published in which uh, the, the record is open for public comment um, by identifiable users, and we revise based on those comments.
comments. And then we're also soliciting these, uh, these reviews. So recently we had a review of our hagiography module um, come out in a uh, French-speaking journal by Ugo Zanetti. Some of the questions that are raised here are, from the perspective of traditional scholarship, how can I judge the quality of something? How can I cite it? And will it change in the meantime? Will it still be there at all? That's one of the most common questions I get from academics is, well, if you're updating this all the time, how do I know it'll still be there? Or how do I know, know where this thing that I'm citing is going to go? So as I've said, we try to address those by clearly labeling the, the records in terms of their status, but also clearly labeling the contributors and exactly what they've done and also providing suggested citations and including this change log that I mentioned. From digital scholarship, the questions about traditional publication, of course, are whether it's accessible, up to date, what kind of license it has, is it incorporated into digital infrastructures, and, and then what about the so-called control of peer review? So, some of the ways we're trying to address those are using CC BY licenses for all of our data, uh, the workflow that allows continuous updating and using stable URI, URIs, as I've mentioned, and of course, using both human-readable and machine-readable versions of the data, exposing those versions in HTML5, TEI, and RDF. So this brings us to our third challenge, which is that of time frame: better access versus better paradigms. And I think the easiest thing for us to do as digital humanists is to provide access to resources that already exist. And that's very valuable. But we also want to change paradigms in regard to how research is done. And that requires building infrastructure, and building infrastructure takes time. So you're probably expecting me to ask you to, something, to imagine something next. And what I'm going to ask you to imagine is transportation. As an American who lives here in Europe, I recognize that the transportation system in Europe has a much better infrastructure than that in the US. And I imagine this scenario, if I were in charge of transportation for a US city, and I wanted to improve the infrastructure for public transportation on a limited budget, what would I do? Well, one option would be buses, buying buses. That could be deployed relatively quickly, using the current infrastructure of roads, and then they might still get truck stuck in traffic. So quick, but it doesn't fully solve the problem. Or we could build a rail infrastructure, which of course takes decades, lots of money, um, but is going to be more durable for the future. Now, for Syriac studies, if we have the access to current resources. If Syriac.org were trying to provide simply access to current resources, we'd have this shorter time scale as opposed to trying to develop new methods where we have a longer time scale. And a couple examples here would include um, if we are providing existing to existing, providing access to existing resources, we could simply put up HTML web pages that linked to scanned texts. But infrastructure building would be establishing URIs for Syriac entities, then linking those out to the scanned text. Or if we want to provide quick access to manuscripts, we could provide a list of shelf marks with links to those manuscripts. But an infrastructural approach would be getting machine-readable, rich manuscript description, and then putting together those descriptions into some sort of union catalog that can be searched um, across various repositories. So papyri.info, for instance, does that for Greek uh, papyri. Some of the questions that this raises then are regarding providing better access to existing resources. Well, what is the most efficient way to put this online? Can I link to a, simply a URL, not even a URI? How would a human user find this information in a search? And how can we make these resources more convenient to use? 
Well, for Syriaca.org, we've emphasized the long-term infrastructure over the shorter-term needs, especially because other projects are addressing some of the shorter-term needs. But still, we do want to, to get some of that low-hanging fruit, as we say. So some of this low-hanging fruit is printed reference works from the late 19th, early 20th century, that if we can get that data into our system, then that can be a starting point. And because most of these reference works are far from comprehensive, then Syriaca.org automatically becomes the go-to starting point for Syriac research, because all of these are combined into one place. But from the perspective of developing new methods, the questions would be how to structure this in a machine-readable way, and we do that with TEI and, and RDF. How to identify conceptual entities with URI, API calls to the data, and uh, how to make possible finding new types of connections in the data. So, for example, if we want to help promote the identification of Syriac entities with URIs, we're moving toward a future in which you can find research relating to a particular Syriac person or work based on a disambiguated identification. So instead of doing a text search where you get a lot of false positives and miss a lot of stuff that is in a different transliteration system or a different language, uh, you actually get the relevant material. Or in terms of manuscript catalogs, uh, or in terms of a clavis of Syriac literature, like the new handbook of Syriac literature that we're working on, we can start from these existing uh, literature histories, uh, most of them uh, a century, almost a century or more older, but, and that will provide some, some uh, basic starting point, but what we really want to do is build them up from manuscript catalogs so that the Syriac works that the 19th century scholars neglected can get better vis visibility and people can start working on them. So, I'd like to conclude just by putting some of these questions back to you and ask you, how do you think we can do this better? So, do we have the right priorities? How can our methods or strategies better support those priorities? And how can we communicate those priorities? Thank you. Probably have time for one quick question, and then we need to get focus on one question. I'm not going to interrupt the too much. So yeah, <laughs> just, just one quick question because we do need to get the yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, could you use the Kashuni translation to extract the name of uh, persons, uh, uh, places, or any entities, conceptual entities? Sorry, I, I couldn't hear you. Which transliteration? Do you use the Kashuni? Oh, Garshuni. Ah. To extract the name of persons, entities, conceptual entities, or places, for example. Well, what we would do is we would we can enter Garshuni into our system, actually by marking it as Syriac language yes. in Arabic script, yes. and so we would use a, a language code to mark that, and we can enter that in, but. When you say to extract, uh, are you thinking of particular extracting it from particular sources? I need to, to know exactly how uh, you can uh, uh, extract the name of persons and the exact uh, uh, forms for the name of persons, for example. In how we can write the names of Syriac persons yes. in, in Arabic or vice yes, versa? And vice versa. Yeah. Um, this is this is an interesting idea. We haven't done done this yet. So Garshuni is Arabic and Syriac characters, yes. and we haven't used Garshuni sources yet to try and control that transliteration. Garshuni itself historically um, doesn't have a completely standard or completely um, stable um, correspondence between Syriac characters and Arabic characters. Um, what we have done is we have used uh, a historical work uh, by Barsoom. Maybe you're familiar with, um, from Barsoom, the, the uh, early 20th century patriarch of the Syrian Orthodox Church, who wrote in Arabic, but his work was then translated into Syriac. And he wrote about Syriac authors and works. And so we're using his Arabic names for Syriac authors 
And then from the Syriac translation, we can get his, uh, the, the Syriac names for those same people. 